Reviews go live today for Intel's Arc 7 GPUs, the A770 and A750. The cards go up for sale in one week on October 12th, and the timing might actually be perfect. Well, the timing would have been perfect back at the end of 2021 when we initially expected Arc to launch, or even earlier in 2022 when the GPU shortage was still at its peak, so Intel could have debuted their best Alchemist class cards as the savior of the masses. But at least this launch now is happening now, and now, although the shortage may be over and GPU mining is pretty much dead due to the ETH merge, there's still a need for affordable GPUs for PC gamers who are all out of kidneys to sell. And while Intel's debut Arc GPU, the mediocre entry-level A380, was not well received largely due to driver issues, lack of availability, and middling performance, the Arc 7 models promise competitive frame rates in the $300 to $350 price range, as well as a focus on value, a pitch that will likely help them stand out since they're launching in the same time frame as Nvidia's new 40 series GPUs that cost $900 to $1600. Welcome to my launch review of the Intel Arc A77. 16 gigabyte limited edition graphics card. Excellent! Today's video is brought to you by the Corsair HS65 surround wired gaming headset powered by custom tuned 50 millimeter neodymium drivers and featuring a microfiber headband and leatherette memory foam ear pads available in carbon or white. Connect to a desktop, laptop, or console via the 3.5 inch jack or included USB adapter. Easily access the on-ear volume roller and flip to mute omnidirectional mic and use Corsair's IQ software to customize personal audio settings or enable Dolby 7.1 surround sound. For further details on the Corsair HS65 headset, click the the sponsor link in the video description. I have a few notes to clear up before I dive into the test results. There are timestamps though, so you can jump ahead for the benchmark numbers if you wish. So first, why no A750, Paul? Well, it's a funny story, but I was actually shipped two boxes labeled A770 and A750, and I started testing the A770 first. Then I went to move on to testing the A750, and I discovered it was another A770. A slight shipping mishap by Intel could happen to anyone. They said that they will be sending me the A750 so I can swap this A770 for it, but not in time for this video. Too bad there's no SLI support though. This review also comes at a slightly awkward time, or an incredibly busy time rather, so while I am confident in my test results, they're not as expansive as I would have liked. I'm just comparing the A770 to the most relevant cards from AMD and Nvidia in terms of pricing, the RX 6600 XT and the RTX 3060. But I did test on the brand new AM5 platform with a 7950X CPU to give these GPUs as much headroom as possible. That said, let's quickly go over the ARC A770 16 gigabyte limited edition card itself, which I think looks really nice. I approve of Intel's aesthetic choices at least. The card has clean lines with rounded corners, a matte sort of soft rubber feel on the shroud that you don't typically find in discrete graphics card designs. There is RGB lighting of course, and while I could complain about these LED hotspots if I was being picky, I don't think it's a major deterrent, and even the default blue and purple gradient color scheme looks very nice without hewing too close to the RGB vomit territory. It's also refreshing to be looking at an actual two slot card, not 2.3 or 2.7 slots or four plus slots like the RTX 4090s with one eight pin and one six pin PCI Express graphics power connector along the side. There's also an HDMI 2.1 and three DisplayPort 2.0 connectors for video outs and a competently designed cooling assembly with a full backplate, four controllable RGB LED zones and an aluminum frame to support the copper vapor chamber and high density aluminum fin stack. The GPU chip itself is the ACM G10 variant of the DG2512 ARC GPU built on TSMC's six nanometer lithography and sporting 32 XE cores, a 21 megahertz graphics clock and a 16 gigabyte GDDR6 memory configuration. Note that there's an eight gigabyte variant of the A770 as well with the same specs, otherwise just less memory bandwidth. Relevant stacks for all the cards tested today are here if you want to pause to compare them. And do note that I'm showing current pricing, which has come down significantly in recent months, particularly for the Radeon RX 66. 600 XT. The 6600 XT I'm using is the power color Red Devil, and the RTX 3060 is EVGA's Black Edition. Moving on to my test setup, all tests were run on this test bed with an ASUS ROG X670E Crosshair Hero motherboard and a Ryzen 9 7950X 16 core CPU cooled by a Corsair H150i Elite LCD 360mm AIO CPU cooler. Memory is a 32GB G Skill Trident Z5 Neo DDR5 6000 CL30 kit, the same one from my recent Ryzen 7000. 
10,000 CPU reviews. And for power, we have a Corsair AX1600i 1600 watt ATX power supply, which should be more than enough. Tests were run on Windows 11 version 21H2, and here are the stats for the rest of the system if you'd like to take a closer look. Let's move on to performance though, and here are the actual clock speeds I was seeing out of the cards while in use. Note that Intel doesn't really list base and boost clock speeds for their ARC GPUs, just a graphics clock, but they are continuing the under-promise and over-deliver on GPU frequency trend by actually running at a higher frequency. 2400 MHz was the peak, and it hit that quite consistently since temperatures stayed pretty reasonable. Here are the peak GPU core temperatures overall, and for Intel they don't list a hotspot temperature, so that second line here is the global temperature for the A770, which was a bit higher than the core temperature, but it is not directly comparable to the hotspot temps for the Radeon and GeForce cards, just wanted to point that out. We also have memory temperatures for the A770 and RX 6600 XT, and I'm happy to say thermal performance for the A770 was just fine, keeping well below 80C for all values and closer to 70C for the core temperature. And while I didn't have time to to test and measure sound pressure, anecdotally I can confirm that the A770 LE stayed pleasantly quiet the whole time, even though I was testing in an open test bed with my head just maybe a foot or two from the card itself. But now it is time for traditional rasterization benchmarks at 1080 and 1440 versus the Radeon RX 6600 XT and the NVIDIA RTX 3060. 3 Mark Time Spot is first, which is a 1440p test, and here the A770's graphics score was a striking 51% faster than the RTX 3060, and about 32% ahead of AMD's RX 6600 XT. A good start for the A series, but we'll see if that holds true in real gaming workloads. 3D Mark Port Royal is my other synthetic benchmark from 3D Mark. It's a ray tracing focused test, which is an area Intel has claimed to have focused on for these new cards, and it seems they were not lying. The A770 score of 6813 is about 36% ahead of the 3060 here, and it's 50% ahead of the 6600 XT. Moving on to real world games, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a DirectX 12 title, and at 1080 the A770 scores a win over the 3060 by a slim margin of 3.3%. The A770 can't keep up with the 6600 XT though, which pushed 170 FPS, 15% ahead. At 1440p, the A770 catches way up, basically coming neck and neck with the 6600 XT, while still maintaining a 12.5% lead over the RTX 3060. Next up is Resident Evil Village, another DirectX 12 game, and my benchmark run begins with the first descent down into the village itself. Radeon GPUs typically perform well with this game, and that trend continues, as even at 1080, the 6600 XT maintains a 12% lead over the A770, while the 3060 falls behind by about 15%. At 1440p, the RX 6600 XT is ahead again by a slimmer margin of 4.4%, while the A770 stays 22% ahead of the RTX 3060. Continuing on to Dirt 5, a racing game with dirt, running the high preset with resolution scaling turned off, and at 1080, the 6600 XT takes the lead yet again, hitting about 130 FPS, which was 15.6% ahead of the A770. At the higher 1440 resolution, the results are similar again, with the A770 clawing back some ground, but still behind by about 6%. Here's Horizon Zero Dawn using the Favor Quality preset, and the ARC A770 has not the best showing in this title, 8% behind the 3060, and more than 20% slower than the 6600 XT at 1080p. At 1440, the A770 catches up to the 3060, placing them neck and neck, while the 6600 XT maintains a 6% lead. Cyberpunk 2077 is running with the medium graphics preset so we can hit playable frame rates, and at 1080p, the 6600 XT manages its biggest gaming win yet with a 49% improvement over the A770. At 1440, though, the 6600 XT's lead shrinks to 18%, and we have roughly the same performance between the A770 and the RTX 3060. Doom Eternal is my only Vulcan title, known for its fast-paced gameplay and demon-stomping antics. At 1080p, the game engine can hit extremely high frame rates, but the A770 was outpaced by both Team Red and Team Green, with the RTX 3060 13% ahead and the 6600 XT 24% in front. At 1440, we have a similar lineup, but slimmer margins again, with the RTX 3060 topping the A770 by 9%, and the 6600 XT winning with a 15% lead. And finally, we have Far Cry 6, where our 1080p results have the A770 losing to the RX 6600 XT once again by over 20%, while the 3060 was ahead by less than 1%. At 1440, the A770 manages to beat the 3060 by 5.5%, though, but the 6600 XT still wins with 97.7 FPS, 14 
7.4% in front of the Intel GPU. Let's round things out with my power draw numbers, and here's the other potential point of criticism for the A770. 436 watts peak system power draw and 362 watts average under load shows it to be the least power efficient GPU from the three tested today, drawing 30 to 50 more watts in terms of GPU power and total system usage. And this is perhaps not a big deal for some, as this isn't scaling up to the range of high-end GPU usage where power draw can get pretty out of hand, but if you were wondering, Intel recommends a 550 watt power supply for a build with an A770, which should be just fine according to these numbers. There's one other thing to test though, and that's XESS, which I want to pronounce XS, but it's frame boosting technology from Intel in a similar vein to AMD's Fidelity FX Super Resolution or Nvidia's DLSS, although they are quite different under the hood. I had only a brief amount of time to test this, but there are four modes, performance for maximum frames, but lower image quality, then balanced, quality, and ultra quality for a smaller frame rate bump, but much closer to native image quality. I started off by running the new 3 d Mark feature test at 2560 by 1440, comparing XCSS off with performance, balanced quality, and ultra quality. And in this test, we were able to go from the off frame rate of 30.26 FPS to 71.36 FPS in performance mode, a 136% increase, 61.58 FPS in balance mode, more than 100% improvement, 53.77 FPS in quality mode, a 77.8% improvement, and 44.71 FPS in ultra quality mode, a 48.1% improvement. I also tested Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which has been updated with XCSS support. I only ran performance and quality modes, but you can see the frame rate improvements here. And I also did a bit of a comparison screen capture to give you guys a side-by-side -side comparison. I will admit that I haven't been able to do extensive pixel peeping to distinguish between these, but there is a slight but noticeable degradation in image quality and performance mode that is compensated for by a big frame rate boost. Quality mode, by comparison, looks a lot more like the native image and would probably only be noticed in freeze frames or side-by-side -side comparisons like this one. And here are my overall test result numbers, evenly weighted by game, using the ARC A770 as the 100% baseline. To sum up, the RX 6600 XT outperformed the A770 by 24% at 1080 and by 5.2% at 1440. The RTX 3060, meanwhile, stayed 2.3% ahead in my 1080 testing and fell behind by about 9% at 1440. This is probably why all of Intel's pre-launch performance data was compared to the RTX 3060, which was regularly selling for $400 or more and has only recently dropped down to $370 to $380. That allowed them to pitch the value proposition and performance per dollar, which is a lot harder to do against AMD given the 6600 XT's current selling price of $310 to $320 and its performance gains in traditional rasterization frame rates. So if it wasn't obvious in the intro, I wish these ARC GPUs weren't launching Smash dab in the midst of huge CPU launches from AMD and the long-anticipated RTX 40 series debut from Nvidia. I would have liked to have spent more time with them, but so it goes. For now, I think I've gathered enough data to see where the cards sit and to confirm that yes, since Intel priced these quite reasonably, they are competitive in the $330 to $350 range, more so against Nvidia than AMD, mind you, but that is also especially if they stay in stock. The other good news is that for me at least, driver issues were non-existent. That's not to say there aren't any. Intel has said it's an area they're investing a lot of hours into, but across my suite of games, everything ran smoothly and without any artifacts, crashes, or other weird behavior. XESS gets a thumbs up as well in that it works and can supply higher frame rates for titles that support it, although further scrutiny and comparisons to FSR and DLSS 3.0 are certainly warranted. But hopefully now you guys have a better idea of how the A770 16 gig stacks up, and with GPU market prices mostly returning to normal, maybe they'll even be available when they launch next week at list pricing rather than immediately selling out so they can be resold by scalpers. That is all for this video though. Closing reminder to check out my store at paulsharbard.net for merch, shirts, pint glasses, and other thumbscrew related items, including my new 8-bit designs like this one, super cool. Very stylish, I get complimented on them all the time. And of course, hit the like button if you enjoyed this video and subscribe to my channel if you really enjoyed it. Thanks as always for watching and we'll see you guys in the next video.